So, hopefully, um, you found the day enjoyable. Um, what we're going to do now is a roundtable kind of wash-up, and really it's an opportunity for you to ask the guys who spoke this morning, um, or me if you really must, any, any questions that have come up throughout the day that you've not had an opportunity to ask. It's your, it's your opportunity now really to ask us anything you like, and we'll tell you what we know. So who's going to start? Ten pounds for the I first question. I don't believe it. <laughs> Nobody's got any <laughs> questions at all about what's in it for me. Hey, Robin, so <laughs> Has anybody looked? Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> Next. So I, I wondered uh, what. Uh, it, first of all, very impressive, and thank you very much for a, a splendid day. Really, truly splendid day. Um, everybody. Um, I was wondering about this, actually coming from the last session, about uh, privacy and consent and audit tracking in the open health record. So, I, I, yeah, I mean, clearly, clearly your question is, is raised around the ATNA. So, the, you know, I mean, the, so um, uh, we mentioned audit trail in the last technical session and the audit trail node authentication, which is a part of the XDS protocol. Um, so I, I was quite pleased when I heard that the open air product supports export of um, audit trail so people have looked at your record out to ATNA uh, because our ambition where I'm working is, is to expand the use of ATNA. Um, we use it already uh, for all views on uh, radiology so across a whole consortium of hospitals now anyone who looks at an image uh, the record of that viewing goes up into a um, I'd say cloud, it's a private cloud, but the, the single audit trail for the, for the whole consortium. So, you know, particularly with GDPR coming along, it's going to be more important you can say, you know, in this whole area with this system covers, who's looked at my record? You don't have to go and ask every individual hospital. I think that's a really positive thing. I, pers I posted something on the CIO board about this a little while ago uh, to ask whether people were generally interested in putting in system specifications um, the ATNA functionality. So your system must publish out to an external audit trail. And I think that that would be a really valuable thing to add it to any system specification. I think if you're going to comply with GDPR, that's going to be a big bonus. Are there any comparisons? I mean, this is difficult, and I, I suspect the answer is no, but it's part of trying to take this forward and get it more widely accepted. Are there any comparisons of doing it the unit system off the shelf way with this way? Now, I know that's a hard question to answer, but it's an, it's, if we could ask that question, it might convince people, like my hospital, the 40 miles up the road, that they need to think very carefully before they buy the big box off the shelf. Who wants to pick up one up? <laughs> I'm not sure I understand the question. question. No. How, do we, how do we persuade the people who are having to make the purchasing decisions that it's a way to go? I, yeah, I, well, it's very difficult, um, but I think we're starting with the fact that we've got this meeting, the fact that we've had, uh, you know, the fact that now people come and ask me about Open HR rather than me having to go and harangue them about Open HR, I think we're starting to, to, to see that change, not just in this country, but in others. And it's because, you know, a lot of engagement that, that Tamaj and myself and others have done over many years. And I think there is just a sea change of, you know, I, I was speaking to Graham Grief, who's the inventor of fire, you know, he's well known, known international informatician, and he is pretty certain that we are about at the high water mark of the epics and the cerners of this world. I see these, you know, that's, shouldn't name names, but they are the, the most popular ones, that this phase is going to go because we have to do something different. You don't have to believe the open air story to know that the, the digital market, as you know, uh, Tamash was talking about, is just dysfunctional. And something has to change, and this seems like a credible way of doing it, in a way that allows new people to grow very fast yeah. and commoditizes <coughs> what we all know that worked in this space is a really horrible mush, including things like audit and governance. We've just got to commoditize all that so people can do really good stuff sitting on top of it. 
That's what platform is about. It's not about interoperability for me. It's just about reducing the, the, the really complex, messy stuff and handing that over to, effectively, a, a specialist bit of software. But when I talk to you a little bit, he, he made one point, which I, I, I thought of, but he, he, he made a very clear point that, actually, if you look, if you look at the NHS as a, as a whole, it becomes even more of a no-brainer. I think it is about education and learning. I think the immediate action is the as far a widespread distribution of the <coughs> defining open platform document. I think that's a almost essential buyer beware. Before you decide to buy something, you should be reading that document. So I haven't got a problem with people making purchasing decisions, going into those things fully eyes informed. wide open and fully informed. The issue is how is getting people fully informed and them understanding it. And as we know, it's a huge domain. There's lots of people in it. It's very complicated. Lots of different financial drivers for doing different things. Um, so I think, as a minimum, you want people to be aware of the options, understand what they're getting into. At the end of the day, when you're buying a, um, a proprietary system, um, either knowingly or unknowingly, you're accepting that vendor's data model. And you're going to have to work with that and live with that. And that might be fine. That might be what you need at that point in time. But you've got to, you've got to um, trade that off with the fact that you're going to be limited. You're not going to be in control of your own destiny. You're not going to be able to innovate the way you may want to innovate because you've got some real limited <coughs> steps there. Can I, can I just also add as well, um, whilst there are not many statistical metrics for our approach, obviously because it's quite new, if you flip it on its head and look at some of the disbenefits of the other approach, and just, just take the, the one market where, where the big box is prolific in, in the US, they've spent billions and billions of dollars on big box solutions in the US. Gartner used to be big proponents of the big box yeah. solutions. Yeah? Gartner now are actually saying this is madness. Congress and the Senate have passed the 21st Century Cures Act, which is forcing these solution pr providers to interoperate because they've realized if, if, you're, if you're a resident of Boston and, and you're unlucky enough to be sick, you could go to one of half a dozen institutions. Three of them are epic and they don't talk to each other. So as a, as a patient in that area, you could hold five completely independent insurance and patient health records in that one area. It's all about what Thomas said earlier. It's, it's about proprietary locking because it's in, a, in their commercial interests. So whilst we don't necessarily know that our way is right, we certainly know that that way is wrong. And that's what drives us, and that's certainly what drove our business case. I was talking to a guy I was in the States last year. He, he, in one episode of care, he had visited three hospitals. Um, and he had three logins for himself, one for each hospital. None of the hospitals would share the information with each other and none of them would even let him download it. But he could log in and have a look at all three, but he needed three usernames and three passwords and three different websites to do it. Uh, you know, the, the interoperability challenge in the US is different than here, though. When you, when you talk to them about interop in the US, they're very much focused on hospital-to-hospital -hospital interaction, whereas we don't tend to have to do that because of the primary care record. So it's fundamentally different here, really. Um, I think you'll see your question. I think you will see a growth in people who are able to run uh, systems like the open air platform in parallel with the things they're currently doing and grow it. Um, so people who've got a well-established, you know, EMR version 1.0, whatever you want to call it, who will, who will be trying to migrate to the next generation, will be able to run things in parallel and experiment with technology. And that also goes for the shared care record systems like the local health care record exemplars, some of those will be able to bring in because they've already got version one of that kind of platform. Yeah. I do think though that for the time being you will see people continue to buy big box solutions because there are folks out there who are nowhere in terms of digital maturity and they just need to get somewhere quickly and right now you know, the, the, it just looks like the risk, the lower risk solution for them to go out and buy those big box solutions. That's what it looks like. I'm not saying it is, but that's what it looks like, and that's why they continue doing it. One, one of the things that often implementers don't realise is it costs a fortune to, in due, to train people to use a large and complex system. Well, you know, you talk to Cambridge so about, about, you know, the 200 million business case. That's, that's public domain sort of numbers. 
the I whole mean, thing. It's, it's from the academic literature point of view, I think there's a bit of a innovation diffusion sort of element as well in terms of preservation from the uh, for the, for the for the top sort of uh, senior management. Something that also Peter mentioned that when there are enough of them doing or many of them doing, it will sort of gradually tilt. But I think it's a gradual process and slowly, incrementally, with sort of dedicated intention like uh, and, and bravery like what Andy is showing effectively as just start taking that step. I think that will change. But it's very difficult to have that absolute comparison between two systems because that's what you're finding in sort of general e-health literature as well. That we don't necessarily need complete RCTs to provide uh, evidence base that takes three to four years by the time the technologies are obsolete. So can we do something as a quick turnaround? So this is a whole, whole lot of culture change needs to happen, and I think it will be a gradual process. Thank you. Let's go over here. You'll be next. Hi, thanks. <laughs> um, so what other trusts are kind of taking on open a EHR? Because Plymouth seems to be one of the first that's doing this. Is there any other in the wings that are starting to take it on? What kind of traction are we getting? All right, so <coughs> Plymouth, sort of best of breed version four, whatever you want to call it. Um, we've got uh, Salford, which is much more of the postmodern bimodal approach. So they're sticking with all scripts, but they're putting in CDR. Then we've got the, the North Thames group. So although that's the primary purpose of those is to collect data for you know, genomics analytics, they are also very interested in using these as CDRs for operational purposes and getting apps built on top. Um, do you know of Leeds. others that are, we can talk about it yet? Um, yeah, I think I think it's uh, oh, so Leeds, Leeds, Leeds have yeah. publicly committed, Leeds City, City as a whole, have publicly committed to develop a um, person held record on open air, which. Um, covers social care elements and other elements, as well as health care elements. Um, we would ex we're expecting to see um, a number of other trusts um, signed up and take an open AP. So um, there's almost two groups of trusts where there is a, a need for an APMA system, and it's a really good APMA system, co-produced with clinicians. Um, started quite a while back um, and they take it primarily because they want an open APMA, an APMA system but others think and further ahead as has happened with some of the London trusts in the North Thames Genomics Group which is mm, I've got this platform in place now uh, that we're using for this we can use it for all sorts of other things now so you start to see um, the exploitation of that platform even though it may have been put, on, put in for a a very specific reason. We've also potentially, as I understand it, I think this is public knowledge, um, at least um, two geographies that have been invited to um, submit a bid for the local integrated care record exemplars have signed up to say that they want to go down an open platforms route for that implementation. It's also worth bearing in mind that <coughs> excuse me, a lot of trusts don't like being first. You know, being first of type comes with a lot of challenge. And we've always found ourselves first. I'm not quite sure why, because I'd like to be second, third, or fourth <laughs> at some point. But many trusts make that conscious decision that they'll fast follow. Let it so it's a bit like taking Microsoft. You don't take the odd patches or you don't take the even patches, let somebody else do it first. So as Peter said, there's a lot of trusts queued up that wait to see these developments become successful deployments, then they start to take it on. And that's when you'll start to see this thing really take shape. So from an SME in Plymouth, uh, then the opportunity is to get in quick and get sponsored by you guys to do something innovative that will plug into... Mm. You've got the message perfectly. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, got. and actually we need both. You know, because one of the things people say is, why would we get a platform? There are no apps. Mm. You know, so you know, and Andy made this point at the very first opening of the day very clearly. We, you know, this is why we're here. We want to build the potential for a market, but we need help to do it. You know, it doesn't come out of thin air. You have to have that dual. You know, who goes well, that, first? That's like Microsoft apps and iTunes, isn't it? It's the same. It, it, exactly. Exactly. So we've got the chat there. Can you just pass the mic over. I'd like to say I agree with the Cerner thing or the big box solution is 
especially with the paperless 2020 um, scheme, I think a lot of CIOs were uh, thinking, well, we just got to get something in. Um, we're seeing that a lot up north. We're specifically in the maternity um, area, but do you see, a, for want of a better phrase, a Goldilocks zone of a, the number of apps? Because obviously you don't want hundreds and hundreds um, because people have to swap between them all the time. But do you see an acceptable level that, they, that you would use as a trust? Shall I pick this one up? Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't have in my mind a finite level. What I do see a need for is some form of u uniformity. Right. So if you post something on the App Store, for argument's sake, there are lots of constraints about how you get that thing on there, which is why iOS apps have a consistent look, a consistent UI. Mm. We need something similar. I don't really care if there's 2,000 apps, as long as when the clinician uses them in, co in the context of how they're accessed, they appear the same so that we can train them and we can manage them and we can support them. And that's what we talked a little bit earlier in the commercial one about the uniformity, the safety cases, and supporting the developers through that process of accreditation, I guess, um, to come up with applications that are fit for purpose. Will this also look at areas where, because Obviously, we do um, our our company do an EHR for maternity, so we collect a lot of data, but we also display it. Is are you looking for apps that specifically collect data and um, display it, or are you looking for a mixture of both? At this stage, I think we're looking for a bit a bit of mm. both. Okay. Absolutely, I don't think we've got any set okay. uh, ideas in mind at this stage. Okay, right, brilliant. I certainly don't. Thank you. And there's different skills of thoughts on this, so there's some proponents that are very much saying that, you know, this needs to be a common UI across all of the NHS. There was an attempt at that through the national programme. I think that's probably a bridge too far in terms of what can be achieved, both commercially and in people's personal preferences. Um, the Code for Health platform allows you to use any front-end dev framework of your choice. You know, if, you, if you're a Python developer or a Ruby on Rails developer, you aren't going to go and develop apps on a platform if you are prescribed that you've got to use this front-end development frame, you're just going to stay clear. So definitely in the, as this matures, you've got to allow people that choice. I think what will probably happen, um, either enforced through any standards, is that generally, you know, good UI, UX pra practice becomes known everything starts looking the same anyway. Mm. You know, new releases of apps on the App Store, the way things are presented, the iconography of it, they all start to look the same, you know? So just by almost natural selection, um, and there is something about natural selection, if you can swap your presentation layer out your app with something else very quickly without having to do data migration, you're into a, a, a selection process of almost the best wins through, yeah? Because it relatively painless to move to something else. So whether that's, you know, a, a, a child health record where, you know, you may need a version in Android, you may need a version in iOS, you may want, there may be commercial opportunities to sell other apps that have got value add that people may be willing to pay for. You'll always need, a, I think, a basic free version for those types of things. So I think, I think, I think natural selection will just happen, especially if everybody's using the same underlying um, yeah, yeah. Also, uh, one thing is which which we have to remember is that you know medicine is very uh, a large field, which means that there we do need many apps, and it doesn't mean that each user will be using all these apps. It's you know this department or this specialty will be using this set, the other one another set, and I think this makes it much uh, easier to think about hundreds of apps, but it's not hundreds of apps per user, right? And the the segment there is. It, is the core design and the core production. So I've been doing a lot of work with open eyes and the requirements that the ophthalmologists have, you know, you would never think of even as a UI UI UX designer in terms of how they operate in darkened rooms, the screens about particular colours, contrast and completely unsuitable for any other specialism. But that's what they require. That's gonna look very different uh, for for good reasons to other things. Okay. Any more from me? I'm conscious that um, some of the guys have actually got um, trains to catch. No? One more? One more quick question? Yeah, I'd, 
like to ask um, the clinical buy-in that you've got. Do you have you, for example, got sufficient clinicians from the different specialties to really help to, to ensure that the models are going to be there, the, the marker types that you're going to need? And also, when you when you're talking about clinicians, are the nursing is the nursing profession adequately represented as a component because they are the biggest in number. They are there 24-7, they access and manage all of these systems, and they're also the ones who really interact with the patients about using the systems as well. So they need to be part of this scheme, uh, and I'd like to, you know, just ensure that you consider that, but I was particularly interested in what's happening today about that. Which I can certainly say we've considered it. Um, you know, we've always been very honest at, at, these, at these things. Clinical engagement, long before this project is, is, a, is a challenge for us. Um, and up to now, we've been largely doing departmental solutions. So we've been able to engage clinicians departmentally, a couple of, couple of consultants, a couple of nurses, a couple of juniors, and so on. Um, as we start to do things like EPMA, it's trust-wide. And it has challenged us, without a doubt. And we've had to do some very different things to try to support it. We've had to form something we're calling a clinical reference group, which has got 300-odd people that have volunteered on. <coughs> Only maybe a dozen attend each meeting, but it's got a vibrant group that are actually um, on, that, on that group. Um, You're doing well if you can get a dozen. Absolutely. <laughs> it's, it, it is an absolute <laughs> constant <laughs> challenge. And if, if I look back over the last sort of six months, because of our Opal 4 status, the chaos that the hospital has been in, more of our project meetings have been cancelled than have actually gone ahead. Um, not just This isn't just IT, this is across the entire organisation. The minute we've got Op Opal 4 pressures, all meetings get cancelled. So it's a huge challenge. And I, I was certainly talking to our executives on, on Tuesday, yesterday, about this. And we, we've, we've got to really sit down and address how we're going to do it. Because, you know, it's not about money either, this. We can't backfill. So it's not about having money to backfill, we actually can't backfill. Yeah, just those of you who don't know Evelyn, who asked the question, Evelyn Hovega is actually one of the pioneers of open air. And uh, the CKM tool was effectively born Thanks, as a, an academic project within Evelyn's department in Australia. So thank you for your pioneering work and also for a great question. I, you know, I've been passionate for years that clinicians have to get engaged in building software. They're not, not in building the software itself, but in the, in the design, etc. And we're into a world where it's not just about saying, I want that on the screen, and I want that in blue, and I want that in green. It's about knowing the data, because the data moves between all of us. It's our shared responsibility. And if we don't take ownership for that, we'll get nowhere. We're the only ones who can decide whether your version of al allergies is right or mine is right. We have to wrangle it out. And it's uncomfortable. We don't train people. We don't encourage them. You know, Evelyn's right. Actually, nurses are much, much better at doing this kind of modelling than, than doctors for Absolutely. all sorts of reasons. And we met on one of our training visits, we met a fairly rare clinician and nurse who just loved this stuff. But he said, look, I've got a full-time job. I will never get time. You know, if I go to my line manager and say, I'm a mental health nurse, I want to do archetyping, they'll just laugh. We have to change this. And you know, right now, the Digital Academy has kicked off which is a great thing, but it's aimed at the people right up there. We need to move this world because part of the part of the change in this world is that we're taking knowledge and expertise out of vendor companies into our organisations. And what they have in a lot of those vendor companies is very skilled clinicians and clinical informaticians. We are starting to take ownership of that and we're going to need to train people up give them the time and the space to understand this world and engage. And what I'm delighted about the interopen process, whilst it's kind of running in parallel to some of this stuff, it's got the right mindset and, and the right understanding. So, yeah, great question. And we've got a lot, of, a lot of support in terms of every clinician we work with across all the specialisms understand how important this agenda is. It's purely a chaos versus IT issue for us at the moment. And it, it is a hard one to crack, I've got to say, but it's not will. If, if you'd asked me that question 10 years ago, nobody was interested in this agenda at all. It's very much not like that now. They're absolutely, <laughs> completely aligned to the need to eradicate paper and become digital. The challenge for us and, and the management and executive team is, is how do we do that in an organisation that is, is under so much continual pressure? But we'll get there. Sorry, Andy, got to go, but brilliant, dear. Thanks for inviting us. 
good turnout, great conversation. So you're all in June at the Clinical Modelling Workshop. So that seems a very good time to hear. That seems a very good time to end, yeah. Thank you very much for everybody coming. Um, is you, the things you're asking me to say. Oh, um, thank you very, very much for coming. We do appreciate it. I look forward to working with all of you, hopefully, on this future agenda. Thanks very much to these guys. Special thanks to Paul and Dave and the guys that have been working with them. Our lovely cameraman at the back. Everybody that's made it a success. A lot of work's gone into this. Uh, but most of all, you guys, I hope you've enjoyed it and I look forward to seeing you again in the future. Can we get a network, a list of everybody attended so we can talk to each other? Yeah. yeah. It's, we're going to send all that out. Well and everybody that's, so we've got a list, we're going to let everybody know who everybody is. Um, we're going to contact all of those people that want to be contacted. Everybody, I've got a pocket full of cards here. Everybody will be contacted, okay? It might not happen until June because I'm on holiday for the whole of May, so I'm not ignoring you. Um, what? It's a shame, I know. Somebody's got to do it. So you, but you will be contacted as soon as I get back. Hi, we're going to send out an evaluation form, an email, probably tomorrow. And within that, we can ask a question. Do you want to have your thing shared? And we can, we can deal with that, okay? We'll also be, be sending out at some stage, at, hi, Steve. We'll be also be sending out, hopefully, links so you can watch some of this stuff again. And if we can, we'll get the presentations off the speakers. But uh, you'll see how that one goes anyway. <laughs> well, obviously, some of you have traveled from a long way. We do appreciate it. So have a safe trip back. And I say, we'll see you in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.